Thus says the Lord, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Can you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make a way in the wilderness. One of the hard truths of life is that sometimes we have to go through the wilderness to get to where we're going. Sometimes we have to be willing to brave the chaos to get to that promised new creation. And as we know, when we're in the midst of it, it can feel like we will be lost forever. But the promise of our faith that we can find our way together. And so, after having spent last week looking back, and before we spend next week looking forward to that promise of new creation, today we pause that we might look around. Today we pause in the midst of this wilderness, in this moment when so many of us feel so lost, we pause that we might find, that we might remember our way together. After all, it's hard to know where we're going if we never stop to consider where we are. Thus says the Lord, I will make a way in the wilderness. Maybe it's just me, but it sort of feels like everywhere we look these days, something's a little off. Not just the clock at 12 corners. But it's everywhere, isn't it? Everything feels a little off, a little wrong right now. Like we're out in the wilderness, unsure of our way forward. And even when we try to take a pretty big perspective, even when we try and take that global perspective, it's almost unavoidable, isn't it? We can't escape it. Something is off, and not just the global pandemic. We recognize the ravages of climate change, don't we? We recognize over the last few years as we've seen it more and more, as winters have become colder, summers have become hotter, and every two years or so brings on a centuries-old flood. Fires and storms extreme weather has suddenly become a way of life. And unfortunately, those least responsible for creating this mess are those most affected by it. Yet again, the consumptive indifference of those with much has robbed the life and livelihoods of those with little. And the challenge, of course, is that it seems so clear, and yet so many people don't really see it there. So many people don't want to see it there. Maybe out of indifference or apathy or overwhelmedness or just plain greed, they don't want to see what's right in front of them. And worse, we have bad theology to blame. As in, so many of the people who claim not to believe in climate change do so, as absurd as it sounds, as absurd as it is, because of their faith. Somehow they believe that the science, they, maybe it's because they don't believe in science altogether, or they believe that the truth of those creation accounts lies in their historicity, or somehow they understand that the promise made at the end of the flood story that God would not destroy the earth somehow means that we can't. And so the world suffers as the very people who were called to steward it turn the other way. 
yet again willing to, willing to sell our birthright for a mess of pottage. Of course, if this were the only challenge we were facing, we might be better equipped to handle it. But as we know, it's not. And though there are plenty of other challenges out there, the ch real challenge is that we don't want to see them. We know that they're there, but we'd rather look the other way, look at the kerfuffle, the ridiculous kerfuffle that happened over this summer around critical race theory, where people, because who because of the color of their skin had never had to think about the color of their skin were up in arms about a theory that their very anger, ironically, proves. No, friends, we have trouble right here in River City. There is trouble out there if we're just willing to look at it. Pick your poison. It's everywhere we look, isn't it? from the, the structures of white supremacy that continue to undergird so much of our society, to the inequities of our health care, our housing, our educational, our political systems, to the inhumanity with which we treat people at our borders, to our unwillingness to welcome the refugee among us, to our obsession with guns, to our inability to recognize the full humanity of our LGBTQ siblings, and we could go on, couldn't we? But the true albatross, that which is dragging us down, is our inability to talk with one another about the reality that we're in. But friends, if we never pause to look at where we are, how can we know where we're going? We've lost the ability to talk about these things. Look around. We leave sex education to the porn industry. We leave political conversation to the talking heads and we save religious observance for one hour on Sunday morning if we're not too busy. Something's off. We can't talk about these things even in church. We don't want our preacher to talk about politics. Why? Because in the end, we don't want to be asked to choose our faith or our party. And while we don't always have to, make no mistake, there are moments in time when we do. And while it seems like an obvious choice for those who proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, let's be honest with ourselves, which do we choose? Which do we put more of our time and effort and energy into, our party or our faith? No, friends, something's off. And pretending like it's not is not going to help us find our way out of this wilderness. Fortunately, I truly believe that everybody who has gathered honestly wants to find our way toward something different, some better life, some new creation promised in Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, not all of us want to do the hard work to get there, do we? The first step toward that new creation is often the hardest. It's the one that we have to overcome the most inertia to get to. But as we find ourselves stuck in the wilderness, friends, we would do well to, those, to listen to those voices crying out to us, trying to show us a way. Because they are there whether we're listening or not. Thus says the Lord, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. I will make a way in the wilderness. At this point, the people of Israel had been stuck for 40 years in Babylon. It had been 40 years since the Babylonian Empire had come in and sacked Jerusalem and taken all of the elites into captivity. Forty years, of course, is a long time in those days, and life expectancies being what they were, it meant that most of the people who were there now had never known anything but oppression. They were stuck. And they didn't truly know if they would ever find their way again. They were in the wilderness, and then came a voice. 
Now, maybe you've had one of those moments in your life, those moments when you are at a low, when you feel a little lost, a little overwhelmed by everything that's happening, and you have somebody, God bless their soul, who reaches out, maybe it's a card, maybe it's a note, maybe it's a hug, who reaches out, becomes that voice in the wilderness to again show you the way. And of course, maybe you've had those moments when you've longed for that to happen, and it hasn't. For the people of Israel, one of those voices was Isaiah. Now, Isaiah is one of those really long books in our Bible that we kind of skim through because it's 66 chapters. But those who did the Bicentennial Bible Challenge last year might remember that it's actually three different books, at least, that touch down in three different moments in the history of the people Israel and was written by at least three different authors, all under one name, Isaiah. The first part, of course, takes place in the 8th century BCE, which, as everyone will know here, is that moment when the Assyrians were getting ready to capture the northern kingdom. The last part, of course, takes place after they're already back from the exile. When they've made it back, spoiler, they do make it home. But that second piece, the part in which our verse comes from today, from which our verse comes today, takes place right in the center, 40 through 55, those chapters. And they're written to a people who do not yet know if they will make it, who do not know yet whether they will find their way. And into that wilderness, Isaiah speaks. We would do well to listen. He begins just as we did last week by reminding them of where they've come from. He reminds them that they've been in exile before, that they have been oppressed before, that they've had rough moments before. Look at Exodus. That though they had been in the wilderness before, God was with them then, and as Isaiah promised, God would be with them now. And as we know, we can face a lot if we know we don't have to face it alone. But having looked back, then Isaiah has them look around, and this is where it starts to get a little heated. After all, Isaiah was a prophet, and prophets rarely pull their punches. He's brutally honest with them about how they've been living together with one another, all we like sheep have gone astray. He tells them that they have failed to live into the covenant that God has made with them. They have failed to live as a people of faith. And then just when they think the darkness is overwhelming them, he points them towards the light. He reminds them in the midst of that wilderness moment that the wilderness does not have to be their final destination. Friends, the good news is the same is true for us. Here we are. We find ourselves in the midst of this wilderness moment, overwhelmed by everything that is happening in our world and unsure of our way forward. The good news is the wilderness does not have to be our final destination. We're going to have to find our way together. That's the thing. We never know what a day is going to bring, and it takes just one moment for our life to turn upside down, to find ourselves suddenly thrust out into the wilderness, unsure of our way forward. Maybe some of us are there this morning. And when we find ourselves in that place, as we know, we need someone who's going to come alongside us and show us the way. That's why we're here. Look, none of us are perfect, but we are more perfect together than we are apart. We're here to figure this out together to keep pointing one another in the direction of life. That's the commitment we make in our baptism, to walk alongside one another and just like the Mandalorian, to keep saying, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. Only as we know, it takes each of us making a choice to get there. We know the way, friends, it is the way of Christ. It's the way of love, only it's not the sunshine and roses kind of love. It's the kind of love that makes us stand up when we want to sit down. 
It's the kind of love that makes us go when we'd rather stay. It's the kind of love that makes us speak out when it would be so much easier to just be silent. It's the kind of love that makes us look at what is happening in the world and not turn away. But each of us has to make that choice. That new creation promised by Jesus Christ starts when we each take that first step. It starts by being honest with one another about where we find ourselves. After all, how can we know where we're going if we never stop to consider where we are? And so, friends, where are we this morning? Where are you? What is happening in your little neck of the wilderness? What in your life is in need of a new creation? We all have something, don't we? I know I do. Especially after the last year and a half, this has been so hard. Even those of us who were most put together have fallen apart. And we're all holding a little angst. We're all a little frayed around the edges and it's coming out in strange ways, isn't it? How many videos have we seen of people freaking out in grocery stores or on airplanes or in restaurants or in school meetings? We're all a little frayed around the edges. We're stuck in that cycle of fight, flight, freeze, and even if it's not fisticuffs, we are not giving one another the benefit of the doubt. What would it mean to hold this moment a little more tenderly, to before we send that email or make that post or talk about someone and not with them, to just pause and remember that they too are a child of the same God, trying to find their way just like we are? What would it mean to remind each other over and over and over again of the way we are each called to follow? We are in the wilderness, friends. But the good news is that the wilderness doesn't have to be our final destination. But if we're gonna to get to that promised land, if we're gonna to get to that new creation, it will take each and every one of us making a personal commitment to do our part to bring about that new creation, for each of us to take that first step to not just see what is happening, but then to do something about it. The good news is we don't have to do it alone. That's why we're here. Every Sunday, some of us come at our very best, and some of us come at our worst. But all of us come longing for that new life promised by Jesus Christ. The good news is the same promise God made through Isaiah, God is making to us. Thus says the Lord, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness. Friends, we know the way. Now we only need to follow it. May it be so. Amen.